okay okay so let me stop sharing so that uh, you can start sharing and once uh, we have some people joined then i will give you a quick introduction and then you can start so uh yeah you can good. start sharing one moment sure uh, 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 uh. And then I'm going to turn off my technology distractions. <clears throat> How does it look? Yeah, yeah, your screen is perfect. Excellent. Just wait for two minutes so that uh, people can uh, join. Maybe they are uh, finishing their calls, evening calls. Very good. Yeah, I imagine this is a kind of a, a challenging time of day where um, life and work begin to converge because uh, the work day is ending, but then also people are, are coming back from their, uh, their commute, but then also the children are coming around crazy, you know, like right. it's time for dinner, yeah. Right, right, yeah. But because of this virtual working, uh, remote uh, working, then probably most of the people are still working from home, so that shouldn't be a big problem. Yeah, I, uh, I was talking to my team that we, we've been a, a virtual company for the last eight years, uh, the whole eight years we've been in business. And um, one of us is in one part of the United States, another part of the United States. And whenever we would have work, we would, uh, I would, uh, yeah, all of our consultants would travel to the office. So we've been a, we've been a distributed company from the beginning, but it's completely different mm. <laughs> when your children are there with you, your, your, your husband, wife is there with you all the day, and, and you start to get a little bit crazy because you haven't been outside in three days. <laughs> right. So, uh, so work from home, this is not what work from home was meant to be. Uh, we're still figuring it all out as a, as, a, <laughs> as a community, as an industry, we're still figuring it out. Right. I guess people slowly pop in, I think in about two minutes. Can we start now? Sure. Okay, so thank you ladies and gentlemen for joining this webinar. And uh, today we have Jesse here. Uh, he has been my mentor since uh, last 10 years. I attended his PMI SCP in 2001. I still remember through PMI, PMC, which is uh, the Hyderabad first PMI chapter. And uh, from then I have been interacting with Jesse he has been a great leader and uh, trainer and coach. So he has kindly accepted to spend one hour of his time for us to talk about agile leadership practices. So I'm also personally so excited to learn from this webinar. Over to you, Jesse. Wow, Vijay, thank you for that very generous introduction. Uh, 2010, 2011 was when that PMI ACP first came out. And even today, people are still People are still pursuing the uh, the certification as a way to expand their agile knowledge beyond Scrum. Yes, and uh, and and so that's that's exciting to see. Well, uh, greetings, uh, uh, good evening, uh, good day, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, 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 Namaskar, Wanakam, uh, 
namaskara salam sub dog sub uh, i'm super happy to be here so uh, i i cannot wait to begin to share with you some ideas about uh, agile leadership practices how can we exhibit the kind of leadership that we want everyone else to exhibit around us and what is the work that we have to do in order to live up to our own standards. And so this session is intended to be very much about looking in the mirror. It's very much intended to challenge you to rise up, to grow up, to wake up to a deeper level of practice in your own day-to-day -day journey. Uh, I'm Jesse and uh, I, um, and I'm hoping that if you get nothing out of this session, that you walk away with this one key thought. This is the most important thing we're going to talk about. And it's simply, you are the leadership role model for everyone around you. You are the leadership role model for everyone around you. You do not need a title. You do not need a budget. You do not need direct reports and staff to be a leader. Leadership is influence. And you are the most important person in somebody's life. I don't know who it is. You know who it is. And because you are the most important person in somebody's life, you are a role model for how to be an influencer with integrity, with balance, with purpose, and with some skill. And that's what we want to unpack today, is how can we live up to that opportunity, that moral calling of being an influencer, being an impact in the lives of the people around us, regardless of your title, regardless of your level, regardless of your credentials, regardless of what you think it's supposed to be, you already are an influencer, an impact maker in the lives of your professional colleagues, in the lives of the people in the office around you. Because leaders live at all levels of an organization. And uh, in, in, in the book, Untapped Agility, that I released last year, uh, we identified three personas, three professional personas. Ted, the team lead. Ted, the team lead is an influential individual contributor, maybe a, a scrum master or a tech lead. Uh, maybe uh, Ted, the team lead, is accountable for tactical excellence, where the specifications are really well done, and the architecture is really well done, and the testing is really well done. Maybe you're more like Maria, the manager, where you do have direct reports and, and staff, and you do have budget, and you're accountable for strategic results meeting deadlines, delivery. You're accountable for um, meeting the expectations of stakeholders. Or maybe you're more like uh, you, if you're not, uh, if you are not necessarily Emmett the executive, you know, and you work with Emmett the executive, who is a leader of leaders, accountable for the vision of where we're going, accountable for crafting uh, a culture, an environment, uh, an organization that lives up to the mandate of the organization. And each one of these personas has impact. The further up in the organization, the broader the impact that you have, but the lower in the organization you are, to, from Maria down to Ted, the more focused the impact you have. To where now, uh, because T Emmett, the executive, can't be everywhere all over the place. And so Emmett doesn't know you. Emmett doesn't know uh, your coworker, doesn't know Raj or Anita or any of those. And so what you do, you can have a more focused, a more powerful impact in the details than Emmett ever could. Leaders live at all levels. And uh, so we're facing a new horizon in the world of work, significant industry changes. 
uh, with the launching of agile methods, with the launching of the no projects movement, with the launching of DevOps and all of these other uh, product uh, transformation, digital transformation, there's a lot of new roles, new team structures, new relationships. And so it's left many professionals, leaders, remember this is the same thing, with a lot of questions. Why? Why are changes happening? Why are they not happening? Um, what is agile leadership supposed to look like? How is it different than just good leadership? And how do I go about going into those expectations? And those questions that you have, and certainly your coworkers and your management has, those are the questions we want to unpack today. So uh, here's the agenda. We want to first talk about uh, what is daily agile leadership thinking look like? What are the thought patterns that we have? And then how do we materialize the thinking into the doing? How do we operationalize a mindset? Because we talk a lot about having a growth mindset or agile mindset or a coaching mindset. And I want to know, oh, okay, but what do you do differently? Or are you just like preaching, like the pundit? Okay, that's, that's a good thought. But at some point, we have to do something differently uh actions speak louder than words and that being said words matter so how do we talk about this how do we explain this in a way where it makes sense to people to where we can actually be heard because it's not just the thinking it's also the doing and the, the talking and the explaining and so we're going to look at some talking points so you can craft and we are going to get a little bit interactive so be ready to type into that chat window because it's coming. Uh, we will be uh, challenging you to think through uh, some things uh, on a personal level so let's do first daily agile leadership thinking. Well, the agile manifesto is the official document the official scripture of the agile mindset it was released. 20 years ago this year this year is the 20th anniversary of the agile movement formalized in 2001 and and the, it covers four key mindset principles uh, we value in order to build products better we value individuals and interactions over process and tools well that's fundamentally uh, that's about empowering our people uh, to maybe bend some rules now and then when the rules don't fit the situation. Uh, and we don't have time to adjust the rules and wait for permission. We just need to give people a little bit of discretion. We value working product over comprehensive documentation is about delivering, get it done, even if it's half done, even if it, there are defects, even if it isn't perfect. The perfect is the enemy of the good. Get it done. While you're waiting to be perfect, everyone else is delivering faster, good enough. And that good enough is faster than perfect, and now we are out of business. Uh, we value customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Instead of a win-lose relationship in business, we're looking for a win-win relationship, a true partnership. And we value responding to change over following a plan, and that's about adapting. Um, so it fundamentally, the mindset that we're pursuing is people first, product first, partner first, and pivot whenever possible. So that's the mindset we're going for, but then we end up with a stereotype. Hi, I'm Jesse. I'm guilty of negative thinking. <laughs> Those people, they don't get it. So, uh, you know, those, those, those people over there, they don't understand what we're talking about. Or that leader, mm, that's not empowering. Uh, that's command and control. Blah, blah. Uh, they do not understand. They're not exhibiting the right behavior. You know, they keep asking for a perfect plan. They keep asking for all the specifications. Obviously, they are not intellectually ready for Agile. We need new people. 
I admit as a champion of this mindset that we're looking, I, my own mindset tends to get a little bit judgmental, a little bit impatient with people who are behind me on my journey. And I'd like to challenge us to reset. Why is this the reality? So uh, and, uh, the authors behind the leadership circle gave a really amazing thought model that it's much more compelling than you're a I'm agile, you're not. That's a dualistic, that's a dualistic kind of me versus you model. A different model would be that today's environment, the complexity of our environment, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, that's the VUCA acronym that uh, is really hot. Um, it's, it's higher than it's ever been before. We're moving further and further away as an industry, as a globe, as a, as a civilization. We're moving further away from stability, certainty, simplicity, and clarity. And so what that means is it, it's tension. There's a lot of tension relative to where we are as influencers, as professionals, because the complexity of my heart and mind is, is in a place that operates best with stability and certainty and simplicity and clarity. It's called cognitive stability. It, like our brain needs these things, but our environment is not giving them to us. And so we have now a gap a growth, a journey that needs to happen. And so rather than saying, you don't get it, I do, you're not agile, I am, it's better to reframe everyone. It's better to rethink everyone in a journey at different stages along their path. And because when we can start thinking about the journey, then we can start to understand why we don't have everyone at the level of agility we want. In the same book, they contrasted, well, how many people exhibit that level of complexity of heart and mind uh, where we can be very creative in our leadership skills? And according to the research, there's four, you know, like the, there are, there's only about 28% of leaders, professionals, managers, engineers, technicians who have that high creative capacity in the midst of volatility, uncertainty, ambiguity. Only about a quarter of us. And that doesn't, and that, that's across all industries, across all titles, all levels of an organization. Just because you're higher up in the organization does not mean you're in the 28%. <laughs> and, and so what we need, we need to embrace the fact that not agile leaders are not the norm. The agile mindset is not the norm. It takes time to grow into that mindset and everyone is still growing. Another book also identified this as even less people. It's even more challenging than we think. And this is Bill Joyner who uh, is the, wrote the book Leadership Agility. He did his own research, a completely different approach and found that yes, people are growing. From, uh, from their current state of awareness, their current think kind of thinking to a, more, uh, a higher level of awareness and a higher level of thinking, but everybody's on a journey. And the reason that it's not everywhere, where you will not see an environment where everyone is agile. You won't, it will never happen because we all start at the same place in our childhood and we all grow into different understandings and, and the next level of understanding and next level. And the reason that it's such a challenge is because of the very problem we're trying to solve. It's called the institutional ceiling. And that is that most organizations do not reward the kind of behaviors that we're trying to instill. Most organizations have a certain kind of behavior that they incentivize and reward about following rules or achieving results for you and being the center of gravity and the center of attention and, and having a hierarchy and then avoiding any risk because then I might make a mistake. And if I make a mistake, I will not get a promotion. And so we're trying to solve this problem. And because of that, at the same time, there are people that are stuck in their journey. 
And so we might be able to now think of a little more empathy that it's not that they're the reason we need agile and they're the reason we're not succeeding, but rather they are on the journey too. I'm a little further. Some of my colleagues are a little further on the journey, but they need a little more time. They need a little more help on their journey. So instead of judgment, I want to challenge us to empathy. <sighs> Whenever you see bad behavior at the office, think to yourself, okay, I do not want to judge. Instead, I can say it's easy to forget how stressful it is when even good things are forced upon other people. Like, I'm unhappy. And now people are telling me to be more empowered. They're telling me uh, to take more initiative. I don't want to take more initiative. I'm happy in my job. Why are you telling me I need to be empowered? I'm fine. And so wouldn't it be great if you had empathy for me, someone perfectly satisfied, perfectly content, being told that everything that I enjoy about my job is wrong? Maybe a little more empathy. Also, remember, he's not a bad person. He's simply at the beginning of an agile mindset, at the very beginning, not a bad person. Too many times we mistake a performance issue to be a character issue. It's called the fundamental attribution error. Fundamental attribution error. It's a big word in, in psychology. And it means that because you're making a mistake, I think you're a bad person. A performance issue may not be a character issue. They might simply be at the beginning of their journey. And then balance, where someone has a different opinion. Uh, maybe it's scrum versus combine. Maybe it's four, four week sprints versus one week sprints. Maybe it's automated testing versus uh, uh, independent verification and validation. And so maybe we might be able to say, you know what, that other opinion is not 100% wrong. Maybe we do need some process and controls with our empowerment. Hmm. Maybe if people know exactly what's expected of them, they'll feel even more empowered. Okay. I can have balance between my opinion and someone else's opinion. So uh, the next point. So the first one is uh, the first one is uh, to challenge our own bias. Now we want to talk more about this balance because the other thing that we found with lead uh, with leadership, effective leadership is balanced. Effective leadership is not just relationships with a caring connection and a team play and a collaboration and mentoring and emotional intelligence. Effective leadership is not merely getting work done with decisiveness and results and, and being purposeful and strategic. Effective leadership, according to the leadership circle model and the research behind it, requires both of these. And so what we want are leaders that can start scoring more creatively on both the people side and the task side of, of, of a leadership uh, effort. This same dynamic is also validated by the other book that I mentioned earlier, Leadership Agility, which is it requires both an accommodative power style and an assertive power style. So we love leaders who are willing to compromise who are willing to step back and give space for other people to contribute. We love leaders who are supportive and patient and ask questions. We also like leaders that are firm with their convictions, that have a lot of drive and help move us forward with positive energy, who are bold risk takers rather than being afraid. We love leaders who are willing to roll up their sleeves and join us in the hard work. Effective leadership requires both. The problem is we all have a bias to the people side or the task side. We all have a bias to the accommodative side or the assertive side. And when stress or pressure comes, we go to our bias, our default position. So we're going to do a quick poll. 
looking at these two lists, I want you to just quickly, uh, uh, for step number one, take a look at these words. Which group of words more resonate more with you? Take a look at these words. So is it the, don't, don't type anything, don't say anything just yet. We're gonna have a fun little activity here. Do you at attach more to compromise, stepping back, supporting, being patient, asking questions, especially when things are stressful, especially when you feel your best? Or do you feel, okay, Vivo, uh, hold on. Uh, thank you for, for sharing. Uh, and we're gonna share this again very quickly. Uh, in a moment. Do you attach more to being firm and driven and bold and acting quickly? On the count of three, I'm going to ask everyone to unmute and shout. <laughs> Not yet. Unmute and shout. <laughs> and then very quickly after we shout, VJ will then remute everyone. Uh, unmute and shout. Which of the two is your default? Which of the two is your bias? Is it accommodative or assertive? When I say three, then you will unmute and you will say accommodative, or you will unmute and you will say assertive. So <laughs> let's see, we're gonna do a shout poll here. Unmute, which of the two? One, two, three, shout. Accommodative. Accommodative. Okay, I heard a couple of people. I heard assertive. I heard accommodative. Uh, and so what that tells us, as we quickly quickly remute to make sure that the dogs uh, are are not chirping in the background, and then then the other animals and the family, um, we do not agree. We are all different. Half of us shouted assertive. The other half of us shouted accommodative. And so this is gonna drive you crazy because when you go back to the office, you believe in being assertive. So Vivo and Sabod, for example, they just chatted, they're completely, they're different as well. And when we go to the office and Vivo, who likes to be assertive, sees Sabod, he's like, uh, why are you just sitting there? We need to go. Why are you like not taking action? We need to act. Why are you afraid all the time? And then, and so Subod is sitting here thinking, uh, looking at Vivo and saying, why are you so ego-driven? Why are you so impatient? Why are you not involving everyone around you? Because I'm inspiring everyone. Because I'm, I'm giving them a vision. But it's only your vision. What about everyone else? And both are true. And both are right. We need balance. Effective leadership is balance. So how do I think about this? Well, if you have an accommodative bias, ask yourself, are you holding back? Is it really that dangerous if you take initiative first? Are you usually quiet? What hasn't been said in this meeting that really could benefit from being mentioned or repeated? Do you compromise often? If you do compromise often, ask yourself, what do you stand for? What are the three most important things that are non-negotiable and everything else is negotiable? What's holding you back from holding firm to just those three, those three things that you believe deeply? Think about that. On the other hand, if you have an assertive bias, do you talk too much? Hi, I'm Jesse. I talk too much. Ask yourself, can you wait to see if someone else brings this up? Give yourself a deadline in the meeting. Look at the clock and you say, if no one mentions this by this point time, okay, I, then I, am, I, I give myself permission to say it. And then you waiting and waiting and then, oh, turns out somebody else came up with a good idea and now you're no longer perceived as the micromanager, know it all who keeps interrupting. You're now perceived as someone who contributes the new information, the new insights when no one else can. Are you too visible? Are you everywhere all the time? Because you have the FOMO, fear of missing out. Ask yourself, could you send someone else to that meeting? 
a teammate, a colleague, so that you can do other things with your time? Do you find that you're very firm and that no one else is willing to agree with you? Well, if you compromise on one topic, might that maybe give you some relational capital that you can use for a bigger topic later? So whether you're assertive or whether you're accommodative, each of us has a bias and a default where we can start thinking about ourselves. We can start thinking, what is my mental bias? Am I biased towards judging others for being behind me on their journey? Am I biased towards being assertive? And maybe I need a little more accommodativeness or I'm biased to being accommodative and I need more assertiveness. So those are the daily agile leadership thinking patterns that we can start to pursue. The second topic, what do we do? What do we do? How can we operationalize this with our daily habits? Because it's our behaviors, it's our behaviors that reveal a lot of who we are. Now, going back to the Leadership Agility book, it defined that there's really three different skills that, we, that fit on top of each other. There's, uh, there's three different stages of skill development here. So the, the, mo the most common stage everyone goes through in their career, everyone starts off with, with learning and education and knowledge. And they do that in order to, to do excellent work, very technically excellent work. And that's the expert mindset. My value is my work. And over the course of time, we start developing a skill that realizes, you know what? I'm not the only one here. I have dependencies. And I am a dependency for other people. And so in order for us to hit the deadline, to build a good product, to add value to stakeholders, we need to come together as a team. We need to, we need to be more results oriented. We need to move away from tactical excellence to strategic results. And that's the achiever skill set, the achiever mindset. And you cannot be an achiever until you know what excellence is. You cannot achieve results until you know what good quality looks like, what good uh, standards and best practices are. As an achiever, you then begin to know how can I make some adjustments some compromises by getting other people involved and coordinating everybody to a common goal? This is where we start moving from people being the mentor and the advisor and the teacher to people being the coordinator, the organizer. This, so leaders can be mentors and teachers uh, with an expert mindset and an expert skill set. But then the achievers are the ones that actually help us get things done with multiple inputs and multiple people and having real impact. But then there's another level. There's another level of behavior, another level of impact, which is your legacy. Is the organization better because you were there? Uh, do you have a long lasting impact? If you want to be so important that nothing happens without you being there, then nothing happens because you can't be everywhere. And so the catalyst mindset is one where it starts to think, how can I scale my impact by helping others be better because they were working with me? And and this is one, the catalyst mindset is one that tends to be a little bit more balanced with that accommodative assertive, a little more balanced with both the people and the task skills. Because uh, someone with really strong people skills can, can be a great achiever, getting alignment, getting collaboration. But it's a new additional skill set to be the catalyst and who coaches people to a higher level. And so here's the question that we ask ourselves. How do I do this? Because every day I have reports, newsletters, metrics, meetings. I have meeting minutes that I have to go to. I got a problem solving, specifications, um, architectures. I have a lot of work that I'm responsible for. 
And I have three different skill sets to choose. I can either do it myself because I know how to do it and I know what good looks like. I can delegate and drive others to do it so that I have more time, so that I have more broader impact, so that I can leverage multiple skill sets of all the people. Or I can develop others to do the work as well. And so then I become a catalyst that enables higher organizational performance, where you begin having a ripple effect in the ocean of the organization. And so in any one of your assignments and responsibilities, you have a choice. You can choose which of these approaches do you intentionally choose. And so here's what we're going to do right now, maybe with a pen and paper or a notepad. I want you to quickly type down what are two to four regular tasks and responsibilities that you have. Take, we're going to take uh, 10 seconds. Think two to four everyday tasks and responsibilities you have. That's step one. I'm thinking uh, for me, PowerPoint. Um, I have a lot of PowerPoint. Uh, for me, it's uh, going to all of the meetings. There's a lot of meetings I have to go to to make sure that um, people are on the right track. Yeah. Okay. For each one of these, what is your default approach? Is it doing your expertise? Is it driving others to do it and getting results? Or is it developing others to do it better? Well, for PowerPoint, my default, I'm almost always the one doing the PowerPoint. Yeah. And for the meetings, um, when it comes to facilitating meetings, uh, I do sometimes ask maybe the scrum master to facilitate a meeting. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's more of driving. Uh, I tend to delegate the scrum master activities to a scrum master, uh, my organization. And so now, uh, so step number three, what would be a more impactful approach? Well, you know, if I wasn't doing so much PowerPoint, if I wasn't doing so much PowerPoint, I would have more time to do other things. I would have more time to build relationships. I would have more time to do one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions with, uh, with leaders and mentor them and coach them. So I should really start looking to drive or delegate um, the PowerPoint. Uh, and to do that, I need to be clear with what are the specifics that I expect from the PowerPoint, uh, what are the step? Where's the where are the resources that people can go to? It's not that hard. It's just PowerPoint. Um, but for the meeting facilitation, meeting facilitation is hard. That's a real skill, and I, I I've been delegating it to the Scrum Masters, but I noticed that a lot of them are really struggling. And so delegation is just the beginning. I also need to maybe develop their skill sets a little bit. I need to maybe schedule some time for some development sessions where I can help develop their skills and facilitation so that I can delegate with more confidence. Okay. All right. So in the chat window, here's what I'd like you to do. In the chat window, uh, uh, so here's my example. I want you to write down, uh, you are, what is the assignment, the responsibility, and then what is your default and what is your desired shift? So for Jesse, it was PowerPoint. Uh, and I want to go from doing to driving and delegating. So using that format, I'm just gonna wait. What came to your mind? I'm looking for anybody to type in. What is a responsibility, your default, and your desired approach. Um, yeah, there you go. I cannot give you any more insights and tips and wisdom until we have Lutchman guiding the team. 
And so uh, what, Lakshman's default is, is probably doing, uh, like being the person who does, gives the direction and guiding it. So he might be giving the team a lot of direction and driving and, and delegating, but he'd like to consider what does it look like for me to develop the team? Thank you, Lakshman, well done. One more, one or two more. Sadika. Sadika says, uh, attending meetings and helping the team resolve the issues and blockers. It's on uh, Sadika's mind. Uh, Praneet, uh, status reports from doing to delegating. Yes. You don't have to do the status reports if, if you have access to some people. Here's one. You people, here's the template. <laughs> here's the template. You type into the template the information that needs to go in there. And if it's not in there, then that means that at the status meeting, you don't look very well. You don't look like you achieved anything. Uh, I love that, Pradeep. Uh, Raja, change and release management SIPs, working with a team to find areas of improvement, maybe um, getting the inputs from the teams directly. Uh, Amruta is also thinking about uh, a few things about moving from doing to driving. And, uh, and Anarud's metrics report, again, metrics reports. Uh, reports are a good place where you can begin to delegate more. Here's one. One, one delegation technique is um, you collect the data and let someone else create the, the report. You collect the information um, and then you say, you know what, um, here's, the, here's what we need in the next presentation. You create the presentation. And then I will actually invite you to do the presentation to the senior leadership. Uh, but here's the information for you. I've given everything you need to do it. If you would like some mentoring on how to make it look good, let me know, because that would be developing. And that's a different leadership skill. Well done, everybody. So we've talked a little bit about our daily thinking and how we can shift from judgment to empathy, from assertiveness or cognitiveness to balance. We've also talked about habits, how we, have it, we tend to have a default habit of going into being hands-on and doing things um, because we know what good looks like and we know what excellence is. Uh, or maybe we jump in and we start giving delegation and, and instead of inviting some self-organization a little bit. So We've talked about how we can change even our habits with a little bit of thought. And then finally, how do we explain these things that is not judgmental and not imbalanced? How do we explain these things in a way that inspires rather than frightens or intimidates? And so uh, one of the first things, if you're going to try making adjustments in your day-to-day -day behaviors, give people a heads up, let them know. If you're a scrum master and suddenly you're no longer organize, you're no longer organizing the retrospective because you want other people to do the retrospective, let them know. Don't simply just stop talking. <laughs> people will say, uh, is Jesse okay? He talks all the time. He's not talking anymore. I think maybe... He's crazy, which might be true. I've been working on my leadership skills team. You may notice me trying to be a bit more accommodative, sort of. Uh, it might be a bit clumsy, but know that I'm doing this intentionally. I'm trying to grow my skills. I'm working on being more balanced in my approach. In fact, um, uh, I'm open to feedback if you haven't. So, Talking point number one, just let people know. And when you let people know, it also builds your self-awareness. Builds your self-awareness about so that you know where you're coming from. It also builds credibility because you let people know that you're intentionally improving your skill set. And the people who are intentionally working on their skill set become role models. Delegate with sincerity. So when you, yes, we just talked about delegating. We talked about moving from doing to driving. Well, if you're going to make that change in your behavior, give them a heads up, but then also 
um, don't delegate in a way that makes it sound um, uh, patronizing or um, of lower status. Uh, and, and so instead, delegate with, uh, as a partner. Uh, don't delegate as, as the, the technology Raj who says, you may do this, and you may do that, and you may do this. Now you may worship me. Uh, no, no. Uh, that's not going to give you a lot of credibility. Instead, if you were to say, I know how I would do it, but I'm more interested to see how you would do it, to see if there's another way, to see if we are aligned, are we on the same page? And so now, uh, instead of putting somebody on the defensive, where they're afraid of making mistakes, now they're, they're feeling a little bit more comfortable with trying on a new assignment, a new responsibility that you're delegating. Remind people of the bigger picture. As you're trying to drive improvement, you're trying to change the culture, we're trying to drive results. And, and we're trying to make change happen, people will get impatient, they'll get frustrated, and they're going to look to you whether they should give up. They're going to look to you whether they should start uh, resisting and objecting and criticizing. And so each one of us should have a talking point like this that points to the bigger picture. So for example, um, I know we have deadlines. I know the pressure is on, but how can we ensure that the results are sustainable and maintainable? Because what we don't want to do is we don't want to sacrifice tomorrow to succeed today. We've got to find a balance. We've got to find the win-win. So what are some ideas that we have where we can make some micro improvements right now that will help us achieve our goal, but also help it be more sustainable and maintainable. So what is the bigger picture beyond the immediate stress and beyond the immediate chaos that can help us overcome the pain and the frustration of the current moment? Here's another one. Are your talking points? Be ready. Be ready with the following script. Be ready to say something good. In the workplace, it is so easy. It is so easy to only focus on what's wrong, what's not finished, what the mistakes are, the uh, uh, violation of standards, violation of policy. No, 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 bad, bad, bad. This is so easy and tempting. And instead, what we want is we want to find a way to celebrate, acknowledge, and recognize this takes intentional effort because we're not rewarded for it. And if you become the one that people know can offer specific and credible compliments, then you're going to find a little bit more support for your ideas. You're going to find a little bit more invitations to the meetings because they know you're not just being fake. Oh, I like what Jesse said. Uh, I actually was, um, <clears throat> I had an assignment once when I was living in Bangalore and, uh, and it was for a British company that had an office in, in Bangalore. And I knew, I, I, was, uh, I knew that I, didn't, I wasn't having impact and I wasn't really connecting with the people. And so I said, maybe, maybe I should start giving compliments. I, I like, I like with, what uh, uh, what Johnson said? Yes, I think I think that's a very good point. And and they it, it just didn't sound right. It wasn't out of sincerity. It was out of fear. And I was eventually asked to leave. And it and it taught me a hard lesson, which is to speak my own truth, but speak the positive truth. So, could you say? I was really impressed with how you closed that meeting. And be specific. Here's what you did that impressed me. You repeated everyone's ideas. You invited volunteers. And then you say why that was good. And because of that, you're creating a culture of more participation. And I'm excited to see that you're, you're contributing to that. Well done. 
be specific, be authentic about your compliments. So that's the information I wanted to share with you today, tonight, wherever you are. Uh, our daily agile leadership thinking might need to move from judgment to empathy, might need to move from our bias for action to being a little more accommodative, or our bias for accommodative to being a little bit more assertive. Also, those default thinkings turn into default habits. And so we need to think about, be intentional. What are one to two, just one or two habits that you can start to evolve to incorporate a little bit more delegation, a little bit more developing of others so that you can be uh, more open, uh, freed up to do other things so that you can have a bigger impact. And then finally, be prepared to explain to people what you're up to and what you're doing. Be prepared to delegate with sincerity and with details. Be prepared to give compliments with sincerity and with details. And so that's what I wanted to share with you uh, today. Uh, I do have some options for you if you're interested uh, to go deeper in this. Uh, we do have uh, a workshop at uh, jessefuel.com slash agile leadership. If you're interested in getting knowledge, you can go to the website at any time and go check this out. But if you want results, if you want change, if you want to go beyond knowledge to actually making a difference, then uh, I want to book a call with you and talk to you about how we could work together in our mentoring program to make everything happen that we just talked about. Um, so jessefuel.com slash agile leadership, jessefuel.com slash mentoring. So those are the things that, uh, that I wanted to share with you guys today. And we have a little bit of time left, maybe to, uh, for some Q&A. Guys, you can ask any questions to Jesse. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so for questions, if you have questions, you can, if you want to, um, you can uh, raise your hand in the participants uh, window, or you can uh, type your question in the chat window. VJ, does that sound like a good plan? Yeah. Yeah. So while we're waiting for some questions to materialize, VJ, um, what, 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 uh, what was most interesting to you in that discussion? So the three leadership styles I have been uh, seeing this, and uh, I myself practicing how can I become catalyst leader. So constantly focusing on few things, what I was uh, doing earlier and how I can change them. So that's a good learning always expert to achie uh, achiever achiever to get list yeah um it's it's a journey it's a pursuit yeah. uh and people may find it interesting that there is an assessment that you can take that will measure how do people perceive you <laughs> Do they perceive you as an expert leader, as an achiever leader, or as a catalyst leader? And uh, I did that assessment uh, a couple of years ago, and I was not, I was not pleased with the results. <laughs> I have work to do. I have work to do. Uh, and, and that's the thing. I'm teaching this. I teach this. I mentor this. Yes, I do research. I've written books on this, and I have a lot of work to do. And so that I think that's uh, that's part of the journey is is recognizing uh, no matter how far you are, you have far to go. Uh, so I, I understand one thing. Um, forget about learning. You should learn how to forget. Ooh, ooh, I like that. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Well, and, and there is uh, there is only a so, so much cortical real estate that we have available. And, 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 and 
with a little bit of mentoring and a little bit of your mentor or coach or a psychologist can help you identify what is consuming the most amount of your cortical real estate. Uh, and that, that's what your, that's what your brain and your, and your heart are prioritizing. Yes. So that, that there's only so much space in there for things. Right. Um, yeah, it looks like there are no questions uh, this evening. So thank you so very much, Jesse, for taking this time. I really appreciate uh, and uh, look forward to having more sessions with you. Yes. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, if indeed um, you want to... Uh, oh, here we go. One question. Yeah, Vikas. So Vikas is asking how to handle a non-performing resource. What leadership traits um, would help? Uh, so because the general recommendation is that you start first with a one-on-one -on -one. and, and uh, having that one-on-one -on -one conversation, it can be very awkward. It can be very um, intimidating. And so there are, there are ways to do the, initiate that conversation with skill, but they des the non-performing resource deserves the dignity of being told face-to-face, -to -face, um, here's, here's what we're seeing. And, and I, uh, I recommend using we. Uh, here's some of the data points that others are offering so that it's not just personal. It's more than just Vikas and his opinion. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a pattern of perception. And, and so then um, in that one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you put together, uh, you, you offer the, the, the feedback, the reality, you invite, you co-create a, pl a plan. And then that nine times out of 10, that's usually enough. Once in a while, it's not enough and it doesn't help You do another one-on-one. -on -one, and if that doesn't help, um, then you let them know is this, uh, I, this may not be the right fit for you. This is not working out. What do you want to do? And give them an invitation to say, okay, maybe we should talk to your people manager about options for a transfer or a different role, or um, maybe you have some ideas about where you would want to go in the organization. Um, and then once you've confronted that, then you can go to the people manager, not just with the problem, but also with some options and some suggestions. That's the most, I think, co-creative partnering approach as opposed to signing somebody we've noticed for six months you're not doing a good job this is the first time you've heard and you're fired that doesn't that's not empathetic that's not empowering and it's not exhibiting that opportunity for feedback driven adapting of performance and adapting of their work skills so that's how i would do it because so just to add um, because uh by treating them humans in your question itself, you use the word resource. So instead people, right? Human, that's, that's one thing. The other, other approach is identifying whether it is a skill problem or will problem. That's very important to understand because both need different ways of tackling, right? So that one-on-one -on -one will definitely help you whether it is a skill problem or will problem and that will help you to use that up right appropriate uh, approach right very good Lakshman. Yes. uh i'm going to uh Lakshman, you are unmuted what is your question yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, how, I, to I deal, how to deal with the conflict uh, with the peers uh I mean, whenever you come up with some solution approach and and uh, it doesn't align with the other teams. So how do you, I, typically in a very integrated uh, scenario, you have one product, other peer team is having another product and there is a conflict on the solution approach or generally the bigger picture is not seen how to deal with that, yeah. Yeah, so generally, so, uh... If you wanted to start a new business, a new consulting business, and, and you would go into companies and solve problems, and you only had one technique, one framework, one methodology, it would be simply this, get everyone in the same room. <laughs> if that's all you do, um, so you can, um, 
invite representatives from all of the teams into an integrated architecture planning session. So that by the time it gets to your team, there's already a unified context with alignment and agreement. Um, if you're discovering conflicts down in, um, late in the late in the development timeline, well, now we have a now we have now we have conflict, and now we have incompatibility, and now we have a mess. So, what is the collaborative conversation we can have before it becomes a problem? And that's one of the key elements of agility, that by having more collaborative conversations, we can prevent a lot of the issues that, uh, that tend to happen with plan-driven approaches. So uh, that's one. And, step num uh, and point number two is it doesn't have to be everyone from every team. Uh, scaled Agile, Scrum at Scale, large-scale Scrum, they, they advocate a technique called big room planning, where we have an all-hands, multi-day planning session. And uh, that's, that's one approach that you want to have in your toolkit. And also we can just invite representatives so that those kinds of meetings can be less expensive, less intimidating and more frequent. So uh, thank you, Lutchman. That was a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, Raja. Can you please uh, share an example from your experience where you felt it would have been better when you did the task instead of being a catalyst uh, and overcome those situations if you do? Uh, so Raja, I think um, one of the answers uh, is similar to when is failing, fa failing the best choice? And the answer is when you have time. Uh, I have found that when you are earlier in a timeline, earlier in away from a deadline, you have time to recover. That is the perfect moment to give people the delegated opportunity to try new things. You can mentor them a little bit because you have time to recover from any mistake-driven learning and mistake-driven growth. As you get closer to a deadline and the stakes are higher and the risks are higher and the, um, the, the opportunity for variation is, is much less, that might be where uh, it's not a good moment. For, it's not a good teaching moment. It might be, okay, who's best qualified to do exactly this task because we're out of time and we're out of money. We no longer have the window of opportunity. So what I have found though, is that too many times we fall into the trap of believing every day is an emergency. Every day is a crisis. Every day we are behind. And so that might be the real problem. It might not be the problem that we don't have um, opportunity to develop and grow people, to let them make, make one or two mistakes and to do some knowledge transfer and to do some skill building. It might simply be that we have a perception of crisis all the time. And that's why we're not having those moments and opportunities. So Raja, I think uh, I really like that question because um, sometimes we can't get to what we need to get to because we're distracted all the time. And so it might be uh, a real need that the real need might be below the surface. Thank you for that. Davey, finding very difficult to deal with a manager who is not supportive and has no trust on team members. Yes, Davey. And that's why we need to learn the skills of, of collaborative conversations. What does a catalyst conversation look like? Um, where we can sit down with our, our manager and invite them in a, co, uh, in a partnership conversation where the manager does not feel threatened, does not feel disrespected, but you can give the manager feedback in a way that invites them to a higher calling. Um, so for example, a uh, manager, um, I wanted to sit down with you because I've noticed a pattern where the team, including myself, consistently miss your expectations. We are consistently not performing to your goals and your, and your desires. And as a result, you're not happy, we're not happy, 
And so I'd like to stop this crazy cycle. I'd like, uh, I'd like to find a way where we can start living up to your standards and living up to your expectations. Is that a conversation that you'd like to have so that you're no longer frustrated and disappointed all the time, but rather feeling secure, content um, with, uh, with how things are happening so that you can then go drive larger, more strategic opportunities? Um, so that's how I would approach it, Dave. Um, and again, bring. so what we're doing is we're engaging that mindset of empathy Gauging that mindset of empathy for your manager who's frustrated all the time. And so if I put myself in that person's shoes, how might I, how might I change my talking points? How might I change my thought patterns? Here's the problem, Davey, it's hard. It's hard to do this. And for that, um, having a coach or asking your, uh, a mentor uh, that you know, that you trust, maybe to rehearse the meeting maybe to offer some tips, that, that can go a long way. And finally, Nathan. Nathan is, at, so Davey, thank you for that. That is a common struggle. Uh, Nathan is asking how to handle a team member client who has OCD, <laughs> who's, uh, um, who's very detail-oriented, not literally, but someone who always wants to ABC steps, even though a lot of times those steps don't add value to the task or project at hand. Um, and so, it, it, uh, Nathan, what you're talking about is someone with an expert mindset. Um, and someone with an expert mindset uh, believes that there is only exactly one way to do things. There is only exactly one way to do it. And if you don't agree with me, you're wrong. Uh, and, and so that, again, Nathan, it, um, it, it takes a little bit of skill to... to uh, partner with that team member about uh about other ways that might be uh valuable to them uh, are you frustrated that you're the one that has to do everything are you frustrated that nobody else is is doing it right and doing it well do you know why we don't agree with you do you know why uh would if there was a way that we could achieve the same results with less time and less effort, would you be interested? And so we first want to engage in that partnership before coming at them with, you are wrong. This is better. That's not agile. You're not collaborating. Instead of doing this, we want to first start with this, the invitation. And it might take time. It may take time for them to open up to the possibility of further learning and growth because for a lot of people with the expert mindset, um, if I don't do it this way, then I don't add value. And so their identity might be in doing it a certain way. It might not be a head issue. It might be a heart issue. Um, so Nathan, it's a challenge, uh, but I do believe that if we, if we, um, do a little bit of rehearsal, a little bit of practice, and a little bit of patience, we can engage people in new ways. Uh, we still have 20 people. I'm going to keep answering questions. They're coming in. Is that okay? Um, yeah, there's one more question from Pallavi. This is, again, common problem most of the times. Yeah, you want to read it off? Yeah, how to deal with the manager who consistently doesn't allocate resources, she meant people with uh, required technical skills. Right now, my manager gave me team members who don't know anything about the technology that we are supposed to build an application with the deadline. Yeah. Uh, so a quick word about uh, uh, Vijay's point about resources versus people. Uh, the reason why that is uh, such a hot topic is because uh, there are some, because words matter, number one. And some words matter to some people more than others. So if you use the word resources instead of people, you may think, what's the big deal? It's the same thing. It doesn't matter to me, resources versus people. But to some, it does matter. So right now in the United States, we are coming to, uh, in, our, in the culture um, as, a, as a country, we are wrestling with our language. We are wrestling with whether some words and terms 
go back to the colonial mindset um, to a, um, a male dominant mindset and to the point where the word, the, some people were saying that the term scrum master refers to slavery. And so words can matter to people. And, and now we need to have a conversation about how some words don't mean what you think they mean and, and where the connotations are different. So I just wanted to add a little bit of color to VJ's point about resources versus people because it does matter to some people. Um, to answer the question at hand, um, Pallavi, um, so I personally, I'm not so concerned about the word resources versus people the way VJ is, but VJ I think is, is more sensitive to the fact that some people are, do take it seriously and, and and I, I, I also myself can be more sensitive to that. Um, so probably step one, if your manager, uh, remember what we talked about when you have a teammate who's not performing well, <laughs> step one, uh, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and say, uh, so I'm hearing some feedback and some data that the people that have been assigned to this project are not qualified. And I wanted to sit down and talk to you about this feedback that we're hearing because I think it's impacting our ability to deliver, it's impacting our credibility, it's impacting our morale. And I just wanted to, to let you know that this is happening. Um, and, and, and maybe to, off, to hear your perspective. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about how these people were chosen? Notice I said, how these people were chosen instead of saying, why did you choose the wrong people, silly? So sometimes if we uh, switch from active tense, um, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that, they're the problem, they don't get, or you did this, instead to a passive tense, well, this is the problem that is happening. Uh, these are the qualifications that we're that we don't have yet on the team with the people that we have. Now I'm focusing on the problem instead of laying blame, and that might lower the defenses of your manager. It might make them a little bit more open to hearing the facts rather than your assumptions. And the facts are, they've had two weeks to do this assignment, and they keep asking for instruction. They don't seem to have the skills. The facts are we're two days late already with assignments and it's a consistent pattern. Here's this date, here's this date, here's this date. These are the facts. And I just wanted to make sure you were aware of it. So Pallavi, that's how we, and, and if, it, if that doesn't help, if it doesn't get momentum, like we tried before, um, then, then you might wanna sit down and talk about to your manager about making an adjustment. I don't think I can work here anymore. Now you're initiating the change. Um, I think I need a transfer um, because this is, you know, these are some recurring issues. And the plan that we tried, um, we talked about it, but it doesn't seem to be having an impact. I think I need a transfer. So uh, this is same, it's a similar process. The one on one conversation is so important and so intimidating and so awkward to where having a mentor, a coach, a colleague where you can sit down and talk about it, rehearse it before you do it can be really helpful. Thank you, Pallavi. So I think that's our last question. So I'm going to just quickly remind you if you wanna get in touch with me, just go to the website, um, but also I'm on social media and I love talking about this. Uh, made it my life's work to help people uh, grow into these skills. BJ, any closing thoughts for us? Um, the, the questions were really, really great, and but it took a little bit of a momentum to open up. So that's what I, I observed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we Thank, thanks for asking so um, very good questions, ladies and gentlemen, it was nice. Well, BJ, I'll tell you, it's been a privilege and I know it's getting late. So I'm gonna let everybody uh, sign off uh, and I hope to keep in touch with all of you soon. Thank you, thank you so much, Jesse. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.